In the previous video, we introduced two muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. Those were the pyramidalis muscle and the rectus abdominis muscle. Before we get into talking about the obliques and the transversus abdominis muscles, let's discuss some important terminology pertaining to the anterior abdominal wall that tends to be a little bit confusing. Now first, let's go over to this picture here. So right here we can see the rectus abdominis muscle. There's no pyramidalis shown, but it would be way down here at the bottom, really small muscle. On the left here, you see the individual segments of the left half of the rectus abdominis muscle, and they're separated by these tendinous intersections. We'll get back to those in a little bit. And if we look at the right side over here, we still have the rectus abdominis muscle, but it's covered by this fibrous connective tissue layer. And this is the anterior rectus sheath. So the anterior rectus sheath is a band of fibrous connective tissue that covers the rectus abdominis muscle. Now, being that it is the anterior rectus sheath, it lies anterior, or we could say superficial, to the rectus abdominis muscle. Notice if we go lateral to the anterior rectus sheath, we start to uh, blend into the obliques. You can actually see the external obliques over here. The internal obliques would be deep to that. Okay? And then if we go medially from the anterior rectus sheath, we get to the midline here where it's a, a significant thickening of that same connective tissue, and that's called the linea alba. We'll get to more of that in a minute. And then we have a similar posterior rectus sheath. This is a band of fibrous connective tissue that lies deep to the rectus abdominis muscle. So going back to the image, if we peeled off the anterior rectus sheath and then peeled off and reflected the rectus abdominis muscle underneath that, under that we would see the posterior rectus sheath. So it's not visible in the image. But an important note here is that the posterior rectus sheath only exists above the arcuate line. Now, what is the arcuate line? Well, you can't see it here because it's deep, but it's about at the level of the navel or the umbilicus in most people. It might be a little bit higher in some, a little bit lower in some. And to understand that, we'll look at this image. This is actually, in green over here, the transversus abdominis muscle that we'll see later on. But notice in the center here, uh, the rectus abdominis has been completely removed. So right here is this arcuate line. And the arcuate line is a gap, so to speak, in the rectus sheath. So above this, we have the posterior rectus sheath, and that's what this is right here. This is the posterior rectus sheath, okay? And then you can imagine the rectus abdominis would be on top of that, or superficial to this, and then superficial to that would be the anterior rectus sheath, okay? So above the arcuate line, from superficial to deep, you'd have anterior rectus sheath, rectus abdominis, and then this, the posterior rectus sheath. But then you get to the arcuate line, and it's this gap where the posterior rectus sheath no longer goes posterior to the rectus abdominis. It actually flips over and merges with the anterior rectus sheath and goes anterior to the rectus abdominis. And so because of that, it would just be renamed the rectus sheath below the arcuate line. It's no longer anterior or posterior, it's just a rectus sheath. Okay, so below this, the posterior rectus sheath merges with the anterior rectus sheath, goes over the front surface of the rectus abdominis, and we would basically call it down here just the rectus sheath. So it only exists above the arcuate line up here. So below the arcuate line, you only have a unified rectus sheath, which is composed of fibers from both technically the anterior and posterior rectus sheaths, where they merge. And then above the arcuate line, you have both of them separated by the rectus abdominis muscle. And then if we go to the midline right here of the anterior abdominal wall, we have the linea alba. And the linea alba is a band of fibrous connective tissue, technically a thickening of the rectus sheath that divides the two halves of the rectus abdominis vertically. So again, over here, uh, the anterior rectus sheath above the arcuate line, and then below it, just the rectus sheath, they've been removed. But where the left half of it meets the right half of it, on the midline, that is the linea alba. And again, it divides into the anterior and posterior rectus sheaths as it moves laterally. So as you go laterally from the linea alba, it becomes the anterior rectus sheath here in front of the rectus abdominis, but also it would move into the posterior rectus sheath behind it. Down here below the arcuate line, it would just, as you go laterally, 
move into the rectus sheath because they're both fused at that point. And it traverses from the xiphoid process superiorly all the way down to the pubic symphysis inferiorly. Next, we have the linea semilunaris, or the semilunar line, as it's often called. So the semilunar line is a tendinous intersection, not to be confused with the uh, specific term tendinous intersection, that separates the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis muscle from the external oblique and internal oblique muscles. So if we look at this picture right here, again, remember underneath the anterior rectus sheath here, we have the rectus abdominis muscle. Right? And then over here I mentioned earlier that we have the external oblique muscle right here. So right about here, so where I'm tracing where this aponeurotic tissue kind of blends in with the external oblique, this right here would be the semilunar line. Okay, this is the semilunar line. And the semilunar line consists of fibrous connective tissue from the aponeuroses of all three of the other major core muscles, external and internal oblique muscles, and the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle. And the semilunar line extends all the way from the ninth costal cartilage, which you can't see here, all the way down to the pubic tubercle. Okay? And then finally, we have the tendinous intersections. We've kind of already talked about those. The rectus abdominis muscle itself is segmented. So there's individual segments, and the muscle fibers of those run vertically. But each of those segments is separated by this fibrous connective tissue, which is the tendinous intersection. So here's one, here's another one, here's another one right here, okay? Uh, and again, they separate the individual sections or segments of the rectus abdominis muscle. And these tendinous intersections also fuse with the anterior rectus sheath. So over here on the right, you have the anterior rectus sheath. Deep to that's the rectus abdominis muscle, and so the fibers of this tendinous intersection would blend with this portion of the anterior rectus sheath superficially, same as this one and this one here, and so on and so forth. And for someone with a well-defined core, we can actually use a surface anatomy approach. So right there in blue down the midline, that would of course be the linea alba, and the linea alba of course separates the two halves of the rectus abdominis, right? from left. And then here you have a couple tendinous intersections. Again, remember they separate the segments of the rectus abdominis muscles. Laterally, you have the semilunar line or linea semilunaris. Remember that this exists on the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis and separates it from the external abdominal oblique here. And technically also the internal oblique, but that's deep to the external oblique over here, which again I've labeled. Now some of this slide might be a little bit of review, but we do need to cover the layers of the anterior abdominal wall in a little more detail. And we're first going to talk about these layers at a level above the costal margin. So we could be talking about a cross section taken where this black dotted line is. So right here you see the left rectus abdominis muscle. Here's the right rectus abdominis muscle that's been cut off. And then over here, you'd have the external abdominal oblique muscle, and there technically would be one way over here too, but it's not shown. Now, we haven't covered the obliques yet, but the external and internal obliques, and also the transversus abdominis, they all have very large aponeuroses. These are all lateral muscles, at least their muscle bellies are lateral. And so their aponeuroses tend to move medially and come in contact with the rectus abdominis. And if we're above the level of the costal margin, we don't have any contribution from transverse abdominis, no contribution from internal oblique. This is purely, right here, the aponeurosis of the external oblique, because only that muscle exists this high, at least in the front over here. Okay? Now, as this aponeurosis goes over the rectus abdominis muscle on the same side, it becomes the rectus sheath. Okay? And it's only going over the front, superficial to the rectus abdominis muscle. So technically, we wouldn't say anterior rectus sheath, and there's certainly no posterior rectus sheath. It's just rectus sheath. There would also be the oblique over here, the external oblique that is. It's aponeurosis comes around the right rectus abdominis. And where the right rectus sheath fuses with the left rectus sheath in the midline, this thickening would be the linea alba. Now a couple other things here. At this level, way up here, above the costal margin, we don't have the transversalis fascia. 
because we have no contribution at all from the transversus abdominis muscle. This is something that will only be present when we get low enough to where we have the transversus abdominis muscle, and there's no parietal peritoneum, right? Parietal peritoneum is the outer serous membrane of the abdominal cavity. Well, we're above the costal margin. We haven't yet gotten into the abdominal cavity, okay? So there's no parietal peritoneum either at this level. All right, so the level of the arcuate line now is going to be represented by this red line right here. So when we say above the arcuate line, we're saying below the costal margin, but above the arcuate line. So we could be taking a cross section right around here, okay? We still have the left and right rectus abdominis muscles, but now look over here. We don't just have the external oblique. We also have this one. This is the internal abdominal oblique. And then take a guess what this one is. That's the transversus abdominis muscle. Notice all three of them have an aponeurosis. Here's the external oblique aponeurosis, internal oblique aponeurosis, and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. If we follow these aponeuroses medially, notice that they fuse. And they fuse on the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis muscle. What would this structure be right here? This would be the linea semilunaris, or the semilunar line. Remember, that's just lateral to the rectus abdominis muscle, where you have the fusion of those aponeuroses from all three of these other core muscles. Okay? Now, once that fusion occurs above the arcuate line, some of that connective tissue goes in front of the rectus abdominis muscle. That would be the anterior rectus sheath. Some of it goes behind the rectus abdominis muscle. That would be the posterior rectus sheath. And eventually, once they circle around the muscle belly, they meet up and fuse and again become the linea alba in the midline. Okay? And the same thing is true over on the right side. Now, deep to the posterior rectus sheath and also deep to the transversus abdominis muscle belly, we have the transversalis fascia. So this is the transversalis fascia. It also goes deep to the linea alba here and it extends all the way around to the other side. And then deep to that, we have the superficial serous membrane of the abdominal cavity and that is the parietal peritoneum, basically making up the outer wall of the abdominal cavity. And then below the arcuate line. So now we're at a level approximately right here where this black dotted line is. So again, left rectus abdominis, right rectus abdominis, and we still have the external oblique here. But notice the external oblique's fading a little bit. It's not as big, or it's not as prominent inferiorly, okay? It's more prominent uh, superiorly. Now it's gonna be mostly internal oblique and transversus abdominis, but it's still there. You can see these aponeuroses are still there. They're going medially and fusing. But notice what happens below the arcuate line. None of that aponeurotic tissue goes behind the rectus abdominis. Instead, now it goes anterior to the rectus abdominis. So this right here would be just the rectus sheath. There is no posterior part. Technically, there is no anterior part. It's just a rectus sheath. Again, as you go to the midline, it fuses with that which comes from the right side at the linea alba. And again, below the arcuate line, you also have transversalis fascia that extends all the way around, and you also have that parietal peritoneum there. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of all this important terminology here pertaining to the anterior abdominal wall. In the next videos, we're going to start discussing the obliques and also the transversus abdominis. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.